started. Um, so just as a reminder, we're now on topic six. Over the next several weeks, we'll be focusing on subsets of topic six. So this week, it's topic six at the top end. Next week, we're going to be looking at engine selection, which is topic 6.6. .6. Then we'll go on to fuselage design and our wing placement, weight and balance, and the like. So this is all to prepare you for the details of your configuration design problem. So over the last bits, we've been talking about those activities that allow you to figure out how big your aircraft is. Now you've got to figure out what it's going to look like and what are the considerations you're going to take in doing that. Now, the nice thing is computation of weight estimation and constraints analysis, that's assessed on exam two. So we won't be asking you a whole lot about those topics in exam number three, though some things about and assumptions about constraint or weight estimation may come up in terms of general sense. What we will be focusing on in the end is this kind of background and basis of your configuration design and then questions that are all up that encompass everything you've learned over the year um, and bring them all together. That's going to be the last exam bit. So we'll talk about that. So um, if those of you who are still voting, if you want to just quickly submit your votes, we'll get started with the poll and we'll work, work our way through the basics of the configuration selection. At the end of this, I then want to show you uh, something in the example spreadsheet that you can use to check your sizing tool. Um, that several of you have tripped up on and how to get around it, why it happens in terms of weird payload range behavior. So stay tuned for that. All of this will be put up uh, for you to view later. Okay, so I'll close out the poll and share the results. So first question. What commercial aircraft, and this is a plural in a sense, aircraft is plural of itself, um, introduced the two standard configurations we see today. And remember, the two standard configurations are the wings under, or the engines under the wing, and then the aircraft with the engines at the back of the fuselage, like these two. So if we go back in time and we look at that, obviously the de Havilland Comet does not have this configuration. The engines are buried in the wing. It's much closer to the old piston propeller transports we had in the day or turboprop transports back in the day. So things like the Douglas DC-7 or the Lockheed Constellation and the Bristol Britannia. The 707, which is the progenitor, of the modern underwing engine configuration. So those of you, the 95% of you who put Boeing 707 were correct. Now, the challenge is that other configuration, the engines at the back of the fuselage, um, and that is the Sud Aviation Caravelle. Um, it was the first aircraft that put the engines at the back of the fuselage. It was a twin engine jet. Then we had VC-10, we had Bach 111, we had Hawker Sidley Trident 727, DC-9 and the like went on after that. Um, for those of you who put Douglas DC-8, what's really interesting is that Douglas came up with their concept at the same time Boeing did theirs. They were a little bit behind. They didn't develop it based on the 707 because that wasn't flying, and they didn't develop it based on the prototype to the 707. Anybody know what Boeing called their 707 prototype um, that they built on their own accord and then tried marketing it both to the US military and to airlines. It had a code name. Nope, it was, yep, the Dash 80, the 367 Dash 80. So Boeing used their prior model, the model 367, which was a passenger transport that was based on the B-29 um, Super Fortress bomber um, that had an enlarged fuselage for flying. And they used that and they, they did the Dash 80 to kind of hide what it was. That aircraft, as it stood, was narrower than ultimately the 707 was. And what Boeing did is that was actually became what we now know as the KC-135 um, aerial refueling tanker that the US Air Force uses. Um, at the behest of Pan Am, after they had decided to also buy Douglas DC-8s, Boeing widened the fuselage of the 707. So it's a slightly different aircraft. But Douglas designed their DC-8, which is swept wing, underslung, and in front of the wing engines in the cells, 
Um, they designed that while Boeing was still designing the 367-80, but they got the idea from the Boeing bombers that had been uh, the B-47 and B-52. So yes, they're contemporary. The 707 was slightly ahead. You could argue that that was the direct lineage off the bombers, and so it sets the standard. But it wasn't something that wouldn't have happened had Boeing not designed the 707. Okay, question number two. When we talk about these configurations at the back of the fuselage, and under the wing. We're talking about the underwing configuration. What are some of the properties of the underwing configuration? Improved hot high performance, easier engine maintenance, lighter wing structure, easier terminal servicing, lighter fuselage structure, and worse weight and balance. Now, as you see, there was a little bit of a trick there. All but one of those are improvements, are good, and one's a negative, but it doesn't matter. Almost all of you put easier engine maintenance. Ah, I'll get to that in a second. What do I mean by hot high performance? That was, I could have done the more specific thing, but I wondered how much you had remembered from the video. Was, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so easier engine maintenance. Yep, the engines are relatively close to the ground. In many cases, literally you can walk up and look at things on the engine. Maybe you need a ladder for some things, maybe you don't. In the case of the 737, if you wanna look at some things, you have to lie on the ground. Um, so maybe it's not so easy. That is definitely a case. Um, improved hot high performance relates to the efficiency of your wing and how good your high lift is. Engines, as a rule, disrupt your high lift devices for one reason or another, and they degrade your wing performance, all else remaining equal. So that was the reason that Vickers, when they designed the VC-10, went to rear engines. They wanted the cleanest wing possible to get the best performance out of their high lift devices to improve performance at high altitudes on hot days in Africa. So improved hot high performance is not generally associated with engines under the wing. It's generally associated with engines at the back of the fuselage. Um, because the wing, um, because of the engines on the wing, they add what's called inertial relief. Remember our wings want to bend up to snap off. And so if you hang weights from the wings away from the, the fuselage, that re reduces that bending moment at the fuselage makes we can have a lighter wing structure to carry the same total load. Also remember that in flight, the wings carry all the weight. So if we put the, we distribute that weight out on the wing, we don't need to carry it through other things. So we have a lighter fuselage structure with, um, with engines under the wing than we do otherwise. Um, easier terminal servicing. Nope, we've got to lift the aircraft up higher off the ground. That means you need steps and ladders where you might not need it otherwise um, for things like getting passengers on and off, fueling the aircraft, um, dumping the labs. And remember, the blue juice is not a soft drink. You do not drink the blue juice that comes out of the labs. Um, and worse weight and balance. No, actually, it's really nice for weight and balance. You don't have weird concentrations of weight at the extremes of your fuselage. Engines are really heavy and dense. So we stick an engine way at the back of the fuselage, like on the 727, and there is an engine way back there. We've got to counter that by having a lot of weight or weight really far away from our wing. So weight and balance gets worse with the <clears throat> engines on the back of the aircraft. And the same thing, um, if once we put engines on the aft fuselage, our ground servicing outside of engine maintenance becomes better because we're closer to the ground. So that's not the correct answer. We have a heavier wing, a heavier fuselage, worse weight and balance, but we get things like better hot high performance. Um, it's also nice for engine out situations. We don't have as much um, loss when we lose an engine, when the engines are on the fuselage as when they're out on the wing. We don't need as big of a rudder. We don't need a lot of things like that because we don't have the big asymmetric thrust problems. So again, it's a trade. The fuselage is heavier, weight and balance is harder, our wing is heavier, but it's easier to service the aircraft generically, not necessarily engines. It's easier to get people on and off and we get better high lift performance for engines on the back of the fuselage. But there are other things that win this out. And now that our airports have gotten much better infrastructure um, and a number of other things, we tend to, on those on commercial transports, be trending towards the engines under the wing. And it's just regional aircraft and business jets where the engines still live on the back of the fuselage. Okay, so that's the general trend in aircraft configuration. 
And that's the basis that you're going to select your aircraft configuration. Some of you will be doing regional type aircraft, 50 passengers flying into airports that don't have a lot of infrastructure. If those of you, anybody here has castries in St. Lucia, that's the small airport on St. Lucia, that would be an airport like that where you might want to consider something that sits lower to the ground and doesn't require that same level of infrastructure. However, if you were got London Heathrow or Amsterdam and Los Angeles, you don't need to worry about that. You can go towards the engine under the wing, but take advantage of those benefits, okay? Any questions on general perform, uh, in, uh, configuration before we move on? What do you mean? So, so someone's asked a question, not necessarily silly. What would happen if the wings were further away from the fuselage? You mean the wings or the engines? Because obviously the wings have to be attached to the fuselage. Yeah, so it's a really interesting um, question. So engines further away from the fuselage. There are two good aircraft that are an example of this. If we look at the late early 1970s trijets, that's the L-1011 by Lockheed and the DC-10 by McDonnell Douglas, started out as Douglas, um, you can see that. The DC-10 engines tend, are closer to the fuselage than the L-1011 ones. And the reason that you want the engine slightly further away, again, it makes the wing lighter. So obviously a four engine aircraft has even better re inertial relief than a two, so that helps it. But the other reason to have it further away is, remember, we talk about interference. Interference between the engine and the wing. Well, you also get interference between the engine and the fuselage. So the further they are away, the less interference drag you get. But the trade is you need a bigger rudder. And that's the real disadvantage. So turns out on the L-1011, it wasn't so hard to get a bigger rudder because the, the number two engine, the fuselage engine, was in the fuselage, where on the DC-10, the engine was in the vertical stabilizer, you had a much smaller rudder availability. So that's that trade there and it, it, what, it, what it gives up. Uh, another question, is the size of the engine not also a driver for where they're placed? For example, the bypass ratio on the 727 is a lot smaller than the leap on the A320 to some extent, but I'm going to then counter that and show you these, these two aircraft at the bottom. Now, the Air France A320 has a CFM56 engine on it, but one of the other engines that you could buy with the A320, and it's what British Airways has bought, is the International Aero Engines V2500 series. The aircraft here on the left is the McDonnell Douglas MD90. It has the V2500 series, mounted on the fuselage. So there is nothing about the bypass ratio itself that dictates you put the engines on the wing versus on the fuselage. You can have very high bypass ratio engines on the F fuselage. And when we talked about when we talk about uh, engines next week, um, we're going to talk very briefly about prop fans. And all of the prop fan concepts were originally on the back of the fuselage because of course they have really, really big bypass ratios big fans, like effectively props. And when you're trying to retrofit an existing design, you'd need a lot more ground clearance. So you notice a lot of turboprops are high winged for that reason. Um, that's the other option. Okay. Um, but it is interesting that the 737 engines are closer to the fuselage than the A320. Uh, okay. Um, what trends have driven underwing engines away from Let's go to the picture that away from this far away, more towards the close coupled. And that is, is it increased bypass ratio, improved computational fluid dynamics, improved ground handling infrastructure, um, financial risk aversion, or keeping up with others so desire to look like others keeping up with the Joneses. We'll talk more about it next week when we talk about engine choice and what it means. But as we look back through this, um, the computational fluid dynamics have allowed us to put it closer to the wing. So don't worry too much about that if you don't get it. It's going to be reintroduced and, and talked about more next week. Okay, number five. Which type of derivative tends to be more successful. And I mean this in terms of orders financially, 
the fuselage shrink or the fuselage stretch? 80% of you said stretch. Anybody remember why a stretch, you're right if you put stretch, tends to be more financially successful, a better option. Okay, so it's not multiple aisles because multiple aisles, that would be to actually widen the fuselage. We're taking an existing aircraft, like an A320, and adding sections, adding plugs to make the fuselage longer, removing plugs to make it shorter. So we have the same number of aisles. Why would adding stuff tend to make the aircraft more likely to be successful? We carry more passengers and cargo, and why would, so we can make more money. We don't necessarily get range because, of course, We've still got the same wing. We're probably still carrying the same amount of fuel. But what would a shrink really hurt us in? Yep, it hurts us in cargo. But yeah, so when we shrink the aircraft, remember, we've still got all the wing. We've got all that structure for the bigger aircraft with the higher payload. And so we, we lose, we, we're less efficient there. Now, that doesn't mean that shrinks are never successful. In fact, one of Airbus's most successful aircraft is technically a shrink, and that's the A330-200. Reason it's successful isn't because it's really structurally efficient and all of that. It's very successful because there was no competition and there was a need in the market for an aircraft that size that could fly roughly that range. What's interesting is as the markets moved on or technologies moved on and we went to the A330 NEOs, the new generation of the A330-200, the A330-800 NEO didn't sell and hasn't sold very well at all. Almost everybody's buying the A330-900 instead. And the reason for that is we now have the ability to carry all of those people that further range that was used in the A330-200 and we don't have the disadvantages. So we have about the same trip costs, but you can carry 30 more people and their bags and cargo, and that's worth more. And so we've lost that. And we saw that also in the case of the A320neo, very few people are buying A319. They're all buying A320 and 21. And the 737 Max, where Boeing wasn't doing a very good job of selling the 737-7, and so they stretched it. So you get a little bit more, um, passenger carrying than you would with the old 737. Still hasn't sold very well because really the market's on the bigger size. Okay, so we're still talking about derivatives and we're talking about our favorite families. Um, let's go to this one. How many derivatives in total have the A320 have? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. And there are, depending on how you counted it, three possible right answers for this. So the original A320, we had two shrinks down to the 319 and 318 and one stretch up to the 321. So those are four derivatives. You count the initial one plus its derivatives. So if you were, that's your four. However, we also have the NEO. So we have the A319 NEO, 20 NEO, 21. So that brings us to seven. So seven, that's the right answer. If you don't count the A320 as part of the derivatives, the original, you could say six. However, depending on how you count the 321 LR and XLR, you could add one or two more. So seven, eight, or nine are probably the right answers. Seven is the core one. So we had one aircraft itself, and then six additional derivatives. And that's pretty good. Keep in mind, um, the 777 family has the 200, the 300, the 200 LR, and 300 ER, and now the eight and the nine. So there's quite a few. Obviously, the 737 is the thing. How many derivatives did the 737 has there been, including the first one? Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, or 15. And by those reckonings, it's 13, 15% of you said it. So you had your original, um, your original 737, as some people call them, Jurassics. Um, so these were the old 100 and 200, the original design in the 1960s. Um, <coughs> the original design in the 1960s with the, kind of sausage engines under the wings. We had the 
classics, the 300, 400, and 500. So there were up to five uh, types, five derivatives with the CFM56s. The next gen with the new re-lofted re wing and new engines, that's the 600, 700, 800, and 900. So there's four more. And then the max, which is the dash seven, dash eight, dash nine, and dash 10. So another four. So that gets us to 13. That's a lot of different derivatives um, there. And each of those changes is done for a reason. Now, interestingly enough, in all cases, the smallest version doesn't sell that well. And the design point has changed slightly. So the original design point was the 100. Then we had the 300, which was even larger than the 200. The 800 was the design point here. And believe it or not, the eight, somewhere between the 800 and 900 was the design point for the max. So they've shifted over time. Um, what a question. What about the 727-200LR do you think made it fail in comparison to 200ER? Um, the 727-200LR is, it's, it's an interesting aircraft. So as a passenger aircraft, it hasn't sold very well. Um, it is the preeminent freight aircraft. So this 200, the 727F, I mean, 777F is, um, is the 200LR in, in freighter design. But the reason it hasn't done well is the 200LR is really a shrink of the 300ER. And what happened is the technology went along, there were some improvements in the aerodynamics, GE90 improved, and you went from having the seven, uh, the triple seven three hundred, which had less range but could carry more people and more bags than the two hundred ER, to the three hundred ER, which actually has more range than this two hundred ER does. So you it carries more people and can carry them further. We shrank that down to get even more range, and it wasn't there. Just isn't the advantage of that additional range um, for the loss of payload capability for most operators. So. That was really the reason why the 200LR does not sell as well as the 200ER. Same basic thing happened uh, between the A330, 200, and 800 and 900. Um, obviously, the engines have come on more than the, end, the gap in, of five or six years in the 1990s. We have 20 years in this case, but it's the same basic trend. It's also the same reason that the 321 is winning out over the 320 in the Neo land. Um, we can carry those same people the same distance or more people the same distance. We really don't get that much advantage by having the smaller aircraft, which can fly a little bit further. Okay. Yep, it is the seven, the 737 here, the dash nine, I believe that's, oh, that's a dash eight or is it a nine? Hard to tell, um, is, is that's a real aircraft. It's Alaska Airlines and they are, a partner with Disneyland, and that's part of the marketing bit. So yeah, um, you see that. In fact, there was an airline in the US back in the 1990s um, that all of their aircraft were in promotional liveries of one sort or another. Uh, it was Western Pacific. Um, I don't remember what they went out of business, were bought up by someone else, but yeah, they were all uh, marketing liveries. Um, it's not really any different than getting on a Ryanair flight and seeing marketing and ads on the inside everywhere these days. <laughs> yeah, you don't see it at 36,000 feet, but you do see it at the airport. And yes, there was a Pepsi did put their branding on, a, I believe it was an Air France Concorde at one time. Okay, so the last of these configuration questions. Why is the tube and wing configuration, which is what we have here, we have a tubular fuselage, attached to a wing, such a durable, lasting configuration. Remember the, the picture at the beginning of this um, slide pack, the beginning of the videos, has the blended wing body. Why is that not displacing it? Risk aversion, flexibility, efficiency, survivability, and beauty. Now, we'll start with beauty. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Some people think that this tube and wing is a very beautiful aircraft. Some people don't. Some people think the blended wing body is beautiful. I personally like both of them for different reasons. So I don't think beauty is the reason it survived, but you might like it. Go back to the top risk aversion. Remember in aviation, we're very, very risk averse. In fact, I will tell you this, the spacing between frames 
On the 707, so that's the ring frames that go around the fuselage, on the 707 is exactly the same distance as it is on the 777. So Boeing has kept the same frame spacing, 707, 727, 737, 47, 57, 67, and 777. Airbus did the same thing from the A300 through the 310, 320 series, 330, 40, and 380. Now, I don't know if they've kept it with the A350, and I don't know if Boeing kept it with the 787, because once you change the structural concept that much, moving from a metallic fuselage to a carbon fiber epoxy composite fuselage, they may have changed it. But you do all of that stuff. You keep it the same because it makes things easier when you're going to certify the next aircraft, a brand new design. We are very risk averse in commercial aviation. So we know all of the pitfalls of the tube and wing. We can do modifications of that. We've never done a blended wing body. But that doesn't mean that there's no hope for a blended wing body. It just means that it's a higher hurdle. 65% of you put flexibility. Absolutely. A blended wing body, when we talk, start talking about weight and balance a bit more in a few weeks, we'll talk, we'll, we'll get onto this, but it's, it's really designed to be efficient for one CG location. And that's because you don't have a horizontal tail. You need to counter all of the mo moments of your wing and your lifting surfaces with just your wing. Having this tail allows you to get very efficient should flight as your CG moves. If you take a blended wing body and you move your CG slightly farther forward, the efficiency drops. So it's really, really good for an aircraft that's gonna be carrying the same payload in exactly the same location. And that payload's gonna be at the CG. So if we get rid of it, the CG doesn't shift. Anybody think of an aircraft or types of aircraft where the CG is gonna almost always be in the same location. and isn't going to shift during flight. A glider. Uh, freighters, no, not so yet. Some military aircraft. How about something a little bit closer or more common? So think of an aircraft that doesn't have fuel. So an aircraft like the B-2 is very common. You have the bombs are always in the same place. The fuel's pretty much on the CG. Yeah, electric aircraft. If I have an electric UAV with a fixed payload, like a camera, the CG doesn't change. I have the same CG at the start of flight as at the end of flight. If my payload, if it's replaceable, but it's always on the CG, again, it doesn't change. So that works really well in many cases with blended wing body configurations. Efficiency. A blended wing body, as we said, is very efficient at its design point, but across a wide range of, of, of operating conditions, tube and wing tends to maintain its efficiency better. So a friend of mine who used to do configuration design for advanced concepts for NASA, is now retired from NASA, he always ended up doing all of the, uh, the blended wing standard configuration stuff against their blended wing body. So he would always do the tube and wing and do their analysis. And basically he could get within 3% of a blended wing body's peak efficiency with the tube and wing and up to 20% better at other points in the operational envelope. So it really came out that it, it does really own, own itself when you have a range of uses. And then survivability, eh, there may be an advantage with the blended wing body um, or I mean with the tube and wing in terms of exits, but they're not much different. Uh, there was a question, didn't Concorde need a flight engineer to manually shift fuel to manage the CG? Uh, it did have a flight engineer to do fuel pumping. The systems were actually designed to do it automatically, but as a backup, but that wasn't because of the way you use Concorde. Concorde is an amazingly constant aircraft. The CG doesn't shift a lot during flight. What changes a lot during flight is the aerodynamic center. Because remember, at low speed, 
our aerodynamic center on our wing is about one quarter of the mean aerodynamic chord. As we go up to and through Mach 1, it moves back to about one half. Well, that completely changes the stability and trim of your aircraft. And for an aircraft like Concorde, it would become untrimmable at high speed or unstable at low speed if you didn't move the CG. Anybody know what the other option for handling um, the CG shift that people use for um, aircraft that did super cruising? If you couldn't move fuel, what else did you do? What was your other option? The Russians used it and the Americans used it on a bomber design of theirs. Nope, kept the payload in the same location, though some people have tried that. Some have had movable soft wings. So we're talking fixed delta wing or delta style plan form aircraft. I think TU 144 and North American XB 70. What did they have for the low speed flight? No, nope, not the foldable wingtips. That was something else with the XB-70 that had more to do with lateral stability or directional stability, sorry. So yaw. What was at the front? Canard, yeah, they had, they had four planes, canard configuration. By having that either fixed in the case of the XB-70 or retractable in the case of the TU-144, you could deal with that low speed um, aerodynamic center shift without having to pump fuel. So the canards, the unfolding of the canards on the TU-144 were considered flight critical and the fuel pumps were flight critical on Concorde. Same basic principle, different approaches to solving it. Okay, so that brings us to our quick um, discussion of configuration. Next week, we'll be talking about how to choose your engines, a bit more on engine placement, um, though it's basic configuration, things like close coupling and the like. Um, and then we'll talk about fuselage design and wing design and the like. Before we go, I would like to quickly run through the issue that some people are seeing when they play around with the sizing spreadsheet. So on the sizing spreadsheet, this is an aircraft will go back up to, hold on, data. Scenario manager. Remember from the input sheet, you can get a scenario. We'll show aircraft B. And we have 325 passengers, 7,800 nautical miles, and 75 tons for our alternate mission. So 75 tons. If I change this to 150 and 3,200 nautical miles, we get a payload range diagram here that is totally nonsensical. And the reason you get this payload range diagram that's totally nonsensical is we haven't changed this payload. There is no way this aircraft sized around 15 tons will ever carry 75 tons. So if we change that to 20 tons, for instance, it all of a sudden becomes reasonable again. It's quite possible to create an aircraft that doesn't close, or we get numbers here. And the reason this happened is our starting guess was too far gone, was too wrong, it was much too high for this aircraft, it doesn't close. If that happens, just close, don't save, close the spreadsheet, open it up, um, because I, usually what happens is if you go into the scenario manager again, sorry, that's not scenario manager, uh, Hold on two seconds. It won't reset itself. Um, it's still broken here. So you just have to close it and reopen it again. OK. Any other questions? There was one more question. Are canards control surfaces? No. Canards are not. It's actually, they're technically called four planes. The configuration is called a canard configuration. They may have control surfaces on them. 
So in the case of the XB70, they had a single movable set of flaps. I think that had two positions, uh, clean or drooped or down. Um, sometimes you have all moving canards or canards with, with like ele elevator type surfaces or four planes with elevator type surfaces. Um, so they aren't automatically control surfaces, but they may have control surfaces on them. I believe in the XB70, the main reason for the droop, the, the trailing edge dropping that flap was actually lift um, at low speed. Uh, and it was meant more to keep the nose at an angle where you could see the runway uh, than any other reason when you drop them. Okay. Any other questions before we, we go? So just as a reminder, on Thursday, you'll be finishing up your constraints analysis and getting your constraints diagram ready in preparation for uh, next week's submission of the tool for review. Uh, the link for submission is available. Um, and it includes what you should put in with your submission so we can give you feedback. Remember, deliverable number seven is totally formative. You don't have to do it, but if you choose not to do it, you won't get feedback. After you get feedback, or if you want to before you get the feedback, you can start doing the practice quiz against the reference aircraft. It's a multiple choice quiz that will be made available later this week. Um, and you can test it against the reference aircraft for the different types of questions to get you in preparation and fix your tool. You can do those simultaneously. Once you've done that a few times and after you get your feedback and the chance, there'll be a week when you can take the actual exam number two. So we'll talk more about it on, on, on Thursday um, before we go into the breakout rooms and then and we'll go from there. Okay, any other questions, folks? Um, you can submit a zip file uh, so you submit your M files in the form with a, so there's three things you need to submit. Your M files can be in a zip folder, um, the instructions for use. And if you have specific areas you want feedback on, a list of those areas and questions you want. So just check that, okay? You can submit as many files as you want because you do. we do a batch download, so it's not a big deal, okay? Cheers, folks. Again, I'll put this up, this recording up.